Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Hey, can we just take a quick second, whether you're online or in person, can we give our worship team who leads us every Sunday a big round of applause? I mean, they did an amazing job. Thank you, worship team. Uh, for always leading us. Hey, we want to say hi to those of you in the room. We want to say hi to those of you online, wherever you might be watching from. Hey, if you're a first-time guest, we always know that it's a little bit of a risk to show up to a new place, whether it's online or in person. We are so glad that you chose to be with us today. We hope to see you next Sunday. Hey, by the way, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here. Hey, I just want to kick us off with why I think today matters to all of us. Listen, you might be online or in the room and going, man, today I showed up, and they're talking about parenting, and I'm not a parent. Listen, I want to share why today matters to you, whether you're a parent or not. Listen, I want to tell, share a truth that we've all discovered the hard, hard way, and it's this right here, right? It's that painting an unfair picture by hiding flaws will lead to unwanted pain for someone. Like, you've experienced this. I've experienced this. Either we've been the one who's painted the unfair picture or someone's painted an unfair picture to us. And it always, like, listen, it always results in unwanted pain for either you or the other person. Like, let me give you some examples because you might be going, are you sure about this? Like, come on, let's say here's a few examples I was thinking about. These are just easy ones, right? Like buying a house, right? If you were going to buy a house, would you want someone to you know, kind of hide the big flaws that might be really expensive? The answer is no, because if they paint an unfair picture about that house and you discover it, that is a financial cost later. That's painful, right? What about in romantic relationships? You know, there's some things that maybe, you know, that you wish that they had been honest about up front. And when you discover them later and they haven't been really honest, how that can create some unwanted results. How about getting a job? If, if you lie on your resume or you kind of paint an unfair picture that you, you're all this and you can do that and then you get to your job and they're like, I you could do that. And I was like, I can, just not really well or at all. Like that doesn't end well. How about applying for a loan? Yeah, I could do this. I'm not in debt. It'll be great. It'll be fine. Here's the thing. Not getting the loan isn't the worst thing. Actually getting a loan you can't afford to pay is actually worse. That creates unwanted pain. How about in continuing education? There was a whole thing where people were lying on their college applications and it just didn't work. It is because of something that you know, and I know, listen, you didn't need to come to church. You don't need to read your Bible. You've experienced that I've experienced it. That when we paint an unfair picture by hiding flaws, someone always gets the unfair or unwanted results. True story. Uh, this Christmas, my dad gifted me with a motorcycle because my dad likes to ride. And kind of the idea is, is that he and I will spend time riding together. And I, I've been telling some of my friends, my people that know me, that, that, that I got this motorcycle and I can't wait for warm weather and warm weather's here. And I always get the same question is, is like, do you know how to ride? And the answer, short answer is yes, but the real answer is no. Like it's, it's somewhat yes and no. So you have to understand when, when I was about seven or eight years old, I went to my cousin's house for like a weekend or a week. I forget why I went there, but they had a mini bike and I learned to ride this mini bike. And this mini bike was so cool. I had so much fun riding this mini bike. And so that's the only time that I've ever ridden like a motorcycle, right? Well, you fast forward, I'm about 19 years old, I'm at my job, and my coworker has a motorcycle. It's a brand new motorcycle, and he's showing it off to everyone. And I go, that's awesome, can I ride it? And he asked me the same question, can you ride a motorcycle? So I painted it an unfair picture and hit the flaws. I said, of course I can ride a motorcycle. I've ridden a motorcycle before. I know exactly what I'm doing, right? And I hid the flaws that I hadn't ridden since I was about seven or eight. I'm about 18 or 19. I get on this motorcycle, right? And I'm doing pretty good for the first two seconds until I run it into a brick wall. Which, maybe that explains why I am the way I am. <laughs> And here's what happened. It led to unwanted results for me and it led to unwanted results for my friend because listen, you know this and I know this, that whenever we paint an unfair picture by hiding some things, someone's gonna get the unwanted results. Now we're gonna come back to that in a second. As everyone's been saying, we're in week five of our series called Imperfect Parenting, What No One Tells You. 
Because listen, whether you're online or here in the room, I think this is for us. Because listen, whether you're a parent or not, and listen, the statistic tells us that 90% of us will be parents at some point in our life. Even if we didn't have kids, we may get married later in life and have kids. And listen, that most of us in this room have been parented by someone. So whether you're a parent or not, I believe this series applies to us what no one tells us. And here's the great thing. Listen, we're week five. And if you miss week one, two, or three, or four, it's okay. You can go onto our website or our YouTube channel and subscribe. It drops every week. And, and you can kind of catch up and watch on demand at your own convenience. Now, back to the thing, though, that's true about all of us, whether you're a parent or not. That painting that unfair picture leads to unwanted results. Well, it leaves you and I asking a really important question about imperfect parenting because there's no such thing as perfect parents. It leaves us asking questions that we need to be able to walk away today with a really solid answer. And here's the question that we need to be able to ask. What kind of picture are we painting of ourselves as? Like if you're a parent in the room, and maybe if you're not a parent, you might be thinking, what kind of picture did my parents paint of themselves? What kind of picture are we painting of ourselves as parents to our children? How do our kids see us? You know, here's the truth, because there's no such thing as a perfect parent, right? Listen, all of us are flawed. Say amen. Like all of us have flaws. I have flaws. You have flaws. We all have flaws. Listen, all of us have flaws. And here's what I've discovered is because we're flawed people, we will always have failures. Say amen. It's not a question if you'll have a failure. It's just when. And listen, adulting is hard. There are going to be failures. And so not only are we flawed, not only are we going to have failures. Listen, adulting is hard. Parenting is one of the hardest things you ever do. Say Amen. And you'll get fatigued. So we have flaws, we have failures, and we get fatigued. And the real question is, is what kind of picture are we painting as parents for our kids to see? Are we painting a fair picture or an unfair picture? Because it got me thinking, I want to I show you this next slide, like, because as parents, here's what we want to do. We, we love our kids. We want the best for them. So we want them to know. We want to paint this picture that we're trustworthy. We want to paint this picture that we're their hero because we are. We would give our lives for them, right? We want to be a good example of how to live a life that actually matters and, and to teach them that, listen, you can't consume your way to fulfillment, right? We want to be looked up to. We want all those things to be true. And so we want to paint a picture of that. But in the middle of painting that picture, there's some realities about our ourselves, that we are flawed, and that we do fail, hey man, do we get tired and fatigued. So this is one picture that we could paint, but there's another picture we could paint. It's what I call the realistic picture, the picture of who we truly really are, and does that actually help prepare them, and does it create a fair standard, and do they feel normal? Because here's the reality. Not only are you flawed, not only will you have failures, and not only do you get fatigued. Listen, I got some great news. When your kids grow up to be adults, they'll have flaws. Say amen. They will have failures. Say amen. And they will get fatigued. And it leads us to the truth because the tagline of the whole series is the things that no one tells us. And here's the thing that I learned the hard way. Listen, listen, this whole series about, has been about me sharing all my failures with you. Aren't you lucky? My poor kids. Listen, I've got a counseling budget set aside. We're good. <laughs> but it leads us to a truth that no one really tells us about parenting. And I kind of want to emotionally prepare you for the statement because when I wrote it, I went, out. that stings a lot. But I've discovered it to be true. And I think when I share it with you, you'll go, aha. Because maybe you had a parent who tried to hide their flaws and their failures and the fatigue. And they painted this picture, but they didn't paint this picture. And it leads us to this truth this morning that I think is, that no one tells us. It's, listen, hiding our pain and our problems. Because everyone has pain and everyone has problems. Because if we're flawed and we have failures and we get fatigued, those are natural results, right? Hiding our pain and problem creates and, what's the word? When we hide that we are flawed, when we hide that we have failures, and we hide that we get fatigued, we hide all that. It creates an unfair picture that makes our kids feel like, it makes them feel like failures when they face the hard realities of life. When they only see mom and dad strong and never sharing and never dealing with their stuff, what they have is they get an imperfect picture of 
of, of who their parents really are. And then they grow up and when they have flaws that are so obvious to themselves and others, when they have failures, it's not an if, it's a when. When they fail and when they get fatigued, what they do is they look at their parents and go, I can't be like them, I am a... Because we created an unfair picture of who we really are. And so it leaves all of us today. Maybe if you're here and you're not a parent, you're going, well, my parents showed me a perfect picture. Like, what do I do? If I've got failures, if I've got flaws, if I've got fatigue, well, what do I do? We're gonna get to that answer. And if you're here and you're gonna be a parent or you are a parent, or maybe you're a mature parent, this will be some things that will help us. It should lead us asking the question, how do we not create an unfair picture? Here's what I discovered about parenting is that oftentimes good intentions can lead to bad results. Say amen. Because listen, all of us, you know, we don't want to be bad parents. We want to be good parents. We want to set that example. But just because we mean well doesn't mean that it turns out. So we should ask the question, what does it actually look like to paint a fair picture of who we are as parents? How do, how do we do that? How do we do that in everyday real life? Not on Sunday morning at church, but Monday through Saturday in the grind of everyday life. And I, I feel like a broken record, but I, I do say this every, every Sunday because it's so true. Is listen, you're not alone. I'm not alone. Every parent has had to deal with this issue. And God knew that you and I as parents would struggle with this. And here's what's even more amazing is that Jesus struggled with a similar tension. I mean, think about this. Jesus was fully God. And he was fully human. And the struggle or the tension that Jesus had to deal with is Jesus wanted us to see God clearly, right? But he was also fully human and he wanted to show us what it looked like to be fully human. And there was this tension between seeing God and all of who he was and being fully human. And we discover in Jesus' example of how you and I can have healthy honesty in a practical way. Because what I love about Jesus is Jesus never hid the pain of his humanity. Jesus never hid the power of his divinity. And what it did is when he didn't hide the pain of his humanity or the power of his divinity, when he did and had healthy honesty, it created dignity for himself and for everyone else that he ran into. Matter of fact, in one of the most important times of Jesus' life, probably one of the most stressful and painful. Jesus reveals this to us, and what's amazing is that we can often skip it because there's so much tension. We know it's coming. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to be betrayed by Judas. He's about to be denied by Peter. He's about to be abandoned by all the other disciples. All of his friends that he loved are about to leave him. He's about to be unjustly condemned to murder. He'll be tortured. And for the only time in eternity, not because he was put there, but because he chose to go there, he will be separated from God the Spirit and God the Father, and he will bear the weight of all humanity's brokenness so that he could fix. And we miss this little encounter in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus reveals exactly what it looks like to have healthy honesty. We pick this up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to put it up on the screen and it says, Mark 14, it says, Jesus took along Peter, James, and John. And so I, I'm just going to stop right here. I love what Jesus models about living in the real world. Jesus never chose to be a lone ranger. And I wonder how many of us model for our children that life isn't meant to be lived alone, that we're meant to do life in community with other people. I mean, Jesus was the only person that could actually done life all by himself. But instead of doing that, he had a circle of people around him. In his humanity, he needed that. And I'm wondering, do we hear that it's okay to need others as we go through this thing called life? I love that Jesus didn't do the Lone Ranger deal. Like, I got it all by myself. No, he took his posse. And are we teaching our kids it's okay to be in need community? Jesus took along Peter, James, and John. And he was, what's the word? And what's the other word? He was sad and troubled. Now I'm going to stop and I'll make fun of Christians for a second. <laughs> Have you ever met Christians like when they drop something and they break their toe like it's busted and they go, praise the Lord. And I'm like, are you okay? You just busted your toe. 
Like, it's funny because, listen, faith is not denying our feelings. Faith is when we can admit our feelings and trust God to do the right thing anyway. Say amen. See, Jesus didn't hide his feelings. He was in legitimate pain. He said he was sad and troubled, he told them. And then here's his honest confession. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He says, listen, I feel so bad, I wish I could die. Like, it is so painful on the inside. It hurts. It is painful. Jesus doesn't go, oh, wait here. I love his healthy honesty. I'm in pain. What I'm about to go into is horrific and it's hard. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus doesn't hide his pain or his problems. What I love is he doesn't guilt or shame the disciples either. He doesn't ask them to do something that they can't do. He doesn't ask them to play God in their life. He just simply shares where he's at. You know what? This isn't the first time that Jesus shared the pain of his humanity. It wasn't the first time that Jesus would share the power of his divinity. Matter of fact, I was thinking of this list, and so I made this list, and, and, and we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this right here. I mean, Jesus was overwhelmed to the point of death, and he says, listen, his own words are, I'm overwhelmed. Have you ever been overwhelmed? Okay, the rest of you are lying right now. Like, the good news is you're not alone. Jesus was overwhelmed. Listen, Jesus got exhausted and needed to sleep. Some of the best thing that you can do is take a nap. Say amen. amen. Now, you need to keep an eye on your kids if you have kids, you know? You know what? Matter of fact, Jesus was in the boat in the middle of the storm, but in his humanity, he was so exhausted that in the middle of the storm, he fell asleep because he was tired. Because human beings aren't God. There's only one of them. We have limitations. He slept. Jesus was hungry. When he ran into the woman at the well, the disciples, he was exhausted and tired and hungry, so they went in to get food for him because he had legitimate hunger. Jesus was frustrated. Jesus showed up to the temple where people were hurting and busted and broken and they were going to the temple hoping to experience God and instead of getting to experience God, they were exploited for financial reasons. And Jesus cleared out the temple. And the shortest verse in the Gospel of John is that Jesus wept at the death of his friend, Lazarus. I mean, Jesus never hid the pain of what it was like to be human. He revealed healthy honesty in the ups and the downs, but Jesus also never hid the power of his divinity. I mean, Jesus would show up and when God wanted to do something, Jesus allowed God to do whatever he wanted to do to them and people that were dead were raised. People that couldn't walk would walk and the blind had their eyes open and they could see. But that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus took these same Peter, James, and John. Matter of fact, we see this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew. We see this that Jesus doesn't just reveal his pain. He reveals his divinity. It says Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, with him again. He didn't do it. Okay, three of you got it. That's great. I'm glad I'm making headway. He didn't try to do it alone. We're not meant to do life alone. That's why core value number four is we're better together. Even Jesus didn't try. He took it up. They went up on a very high mountain where they could be alone. There in front of the disciples, Jesus was completely changed. They got to see his divinity. His face was shining like the sun and his clothes became white as light. They got to see who he truly was. And what I love about the honesty of Jesus is it gave his disciples dignity. It kept his dignity. He didn't have to lie or hide or pretend. And it leads us to what Jesus models, a truth that the eyewitness accounts of Jesus teach us that's so important as parents. And if we haven't been parented the right way, and there's no such thing as a perfect parent, so maybe we need this as adults now. But I love what Jesus teaches, and here's what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches us this. Jesus never, Jesus never hid the pain of his humanity or the power of his divinity. I wonder how many times we hide from our kids that we're just exhausted, or maybe that we're a little bit sad, maybe that we're in a tough stretch. I'm not talking about guilting or shaming our kids. I'm not talking about freaking them out. Hey, we lost our job and you're going to be homeless. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about healthy honesty where we look our kids in the eye and go, I love you, mom and dad's for you, or mom's just tired, or dad's, dad's just in a rough spot right now. 
His healthy honesty allowed the disciples to give grace to. See, when Jesus was honest about the pain of his humanity, they could look at Jesus and go, if the Son of God could be sad, if the Son of God could be overwhelmed, if the Son of God could be tired, if the Son of God could be frustrated, if the Son of God could weep, then so can you see, it's how the honesty gave them grace to allow them to be human because he was not only fully God, he was fully human. It allowed them to give grace to themselves because you can't give what you don't have. The world needs grace. And if you haven't received grace, it's really hard to give it. His healthy honesty allowed the disciples to give grace to themselves while having faith in God. You see, they were able to give grace to themselves and see Jesus and understand that, that life is hard and there are going to be times where they're going to have flaws and they're going to fail and they're going to be fatigued. But the good news is they can have faith in God who will show up and do what only he can do. Now watch this. What if parents had healthy honesty that allowed children to give grace to themselves while having faith in their parents who have been true and honest to them. All of a sudden, when our kids get older and their flaws are obvious to themselves, not if they fail, when they fail. Not if they get fatigued, but when they get fatigued. Instead of feeling like a failure and feeling guilty and shameful, what if they've been given the example that it's okay and taught what it's like to be able to move through those things so that they feel normal and prepared to face the realities of what adulthood really looks like in the real world. And here's what I discovered. There's a couple of things you just have to do to have healthy honesty. You know, see, here's what I discovered. You can believe something and you can know something, but believing and knowing something is very different than doing something. Say amen. amen. Right? Because we can all believe that we should eat healthy until we ate that whole bag of chips. <laughs> we can know that we should exercise until we go, oh, it's really hot outside. The air condition feels so good. I'm going to lay on the couch some more. Like believing and knowing is very different than actually doing. And life is not found in just the knowing and believing. We need that. But life is found in the doing of it. And so what is healthy honesty actually look like so that we can actually prepare and set our kids up to win. Maybe if we don't have kids, maybe this is to set us up to win so that maybe we can get what we didn't get from our parents that God could give us. And here's what I discovered. There are, there are three things that you actually have to do to display healthy honesty. Matter of fact, I'm not going to even hide them from you. Here, here are the three things. These are all going to be really fun. Say Amen. <laughs> You're not going to like any of these. When I wrote them, I said, I hate all of these. No one's going to like me. Why do I have to speak this Sunday, Jesus? Like, this is no fun. Like, the first one is confess our defects. Woo, I get fired. No, no one gets fired up for that. To confront our dysfunction. Listen, no matter how good of a family or how bad of a family you come from, we all have some. And care for our damage. No one gets through life undamaged. Everyone is flawed and the systems are broken. So no one gets through life unscathed. And so the first thing to do to have healthy honesty is we have to confess our defects, we have to confront our dysfunction, and we have to care for our damage. And here's the most amazing thing. I love what I heard another pastor. His name was Andy Stanley. He said, kids could care less about our advice. Say amen. You want to know why kids could care less about our advice? It's because they are bombarded with advice every day on social media and everywhere they go. You know what changes a kid's life is when they admire our behavior. Let me, let me, y'all miss that one. <laughs> that was free. We don't want our kids to like our advice. We want them to admire our behavior. Because advice is easy to know but not do. But when you respect and admire behavior, you might be willing to step out and do that. So the first one is confess our defects. And, and here's kind of the first thing that I learned. Just because we're the parent doesn't always make us right. And see, when we confess our defects, you know what we're saying? Is we're telling our kids one of the most important human relationship truths that there is. I care more about the relationship than the image of being perfect. Let me say that one more time. 
if I got it wrong, which I have gotten it wrong a lot as a parent, right? When we apologize, because listen, what I've discovered is when I'm wrong and I do something that is hurtful wrong, I should say I'm sorry, right? We do that to God, we do it to other adults. Why in the world wouldn't we do it to our kids? And when we apologize and when we confess our defects to our kids, what we're saying is, I care more about the relationship than I do about creating this image of being a perfect parent. And what it does for the kid is it sets this idea that perfection is not the standard progress is. See, when we say we're sorry, when we go, yep, I got that wrong, I overspoke, I overstepped, I was over angry, yep, you were wrong and I was right, I mean, you were right and I was wrong, see, it's just built into my head that you're wrong. <laughs> it's parenting, parenting 101, you're wrong, I'm right, it doesn't matter. Right, you know, hey, you were right and I, I was wrong and, and you know, we, we apologize. It sets this idea that like perfection is not the goal, progress is. I love sharing stories about my life when I was really old. It's really harder to share stories that are current, but this, this one's pretty current. This one's probably only a couple months old. Um, my oldest daughter's still living at home. She's saving money. She's going to get her master's. And she had ordered something um, kind of on like FedEx. And I, I don't want to get into the whole story, but it was a live lizard. She loves lizards and she has some lizard tanks and she wants snakes, but I said, not in my house, right? And and so she got this lizard. And so the only way to get them is you have to order them on like a couple of days where there's going to be some warm weather. And, and there's only one company that will do live. And so it was supposed to come. And, and they said they tried to deliver it, but she wasn't the door. And she said, that's a lie. I literally sat outside in, in the living room where the door was all day doing my work so that if, the, if the, you showed up. And they're like, well, do you have a ring? And she was like, no. And they're like, oh, yeah, we tried. And I was like... Just, no, come on. And so, like, she was really frustrated. And the next day they delivered, and the next day they delivered. And, man, she was living, and, and she was just, I mean, she was just being a drama queen. I mean, I have no idea where she would get such drama from someone in her family. <laughs> she gets it honestly, right? And here's what I discovered, a parent. This one's just free. This isn't even part of the message is, as parents, we often get the most angriest at the thing we see in our kids that we don't like about ourselves. Right, the thing that gives us the most grief about our kids is when we see ourselves that we don't like in them. And so I just said, hey, stop it. Like, you're being a drama queen. Like, just come on. Like, why don't you show some resilience, kid? Like, it's just a thing. I'll help you. I'll pay for the lizard. We'll get up. Like, it'll be fine at the end of the day. Come on, we, you got this. Toughen up, kid. To which she, and you know, I was really proud of her. She was a hall. She, in that moment, she looked at me and said, oh, dad, you mean resilient? And then she gave an example where she showed years of resiliency in this one area and said, you mean like that, dad? And I instantly, like instantly was just cut to the heart. Like, instantly knew, oh, I'm dead wrong in that moment. Now, I wish I could tell you that I was a great follower of Jesus and a great pastor and just instantly was like, oh, my fault. No, I'm pretty hard-headed. You know, the next day I had to go back as I fell asleep. I just remember, man, I got it wrong. And so I went back to my daughter and I said, hey, I'm really sorry. You are absolutely right. You are very resilient. You do hard things. I was wrong. And here's what she said. She said, it's okay, Dad. I said, no, it's not okay. I'm asking you for forgiveness. I did something that was wrong. And I just want you to know that it breaks my heart because I don't want to hurt you. You're, you're my daughter. And so here's what I discovered. Healthy honesty means first is we have to confess our defects. Because if our kids never see an example of someone owning up to their own stuff, how will they ever own their things? Confront our dysfunction. This is really tough because all of us have it. And we all have a bunch of advice for everyone else's dysfunction, right? I mean, we talk about our neighbor. We'll talk about our people we go to church with. We'll talk about people on our softball team. We'll talk about people at our co work We'll talk about people at our gym, their dysfunction. But when it comes to actually confronting our own dysfunction, you know, those behaviors that create brokenness, and we all have some of it. And our kids are going to have some of it. And they're going to need to learn how to confront their dysfunction. And what they don't need is advice. What they need is someone that they admire. They need an example of someone who they've seen walk through their dysfunction so that they know how to walk through their dysfunction. They need more than advice. They need someone that they can look up and admire to. True story. And probably the hardest season of my adopted family's life. I mean, it was just, I'm not going to go into the details, but it, it, for all of my siblings, for all of my family, it was, it was just traumatic. It was painful. It, it was horrific. I would, I would never wish this on my worst enemy. 
And so in the middle of this, my, my wife and I had actually moved up here to St. Mary's. And so I was kind of talking to my family, kind of long distance in, in Virginia. And um, I would be talking to my dad. And my dad had decided in the midst of this just very difficult season, in the midst of all this trauma, that he was going to go see a counselor. And you have to understand something about my adopted dad. My adopted dad is my hero. My adopted dad has always been kind of up on this pedestal. And the fact that my adopted dad would go, I need help. Something's broken. I need help beyond myself. I need to go get something. There's been some dysfunction. Something is busted and broken. And I need to confront this because I don't want the pain of this to continue. And then my, my dad would talk about it. He never would play the blame game. It's someone else's fault. My dad was always very self-aware. and He was always honest about the things that he could control and what he could do differently and how he made mistakes. And I'm telling you what, my adopted dad is my hero, not because he's perfect, but because I admire his behavior. There's lots of people who give advice. I've seen lots of people who give advice who don't follow their own advice, say amen. But my dad, I admire his behavior. And I wonder if what our kids don't need is an image of perfection. What I wonder if they need someone who sets the example of actually confronting or confessing their defects and then confronting their dysfunction so that when their dysfunction raises up in their life, they actually know what it looks like to take steps and get help. You know, here at South Point, we have professional counselors we can connect you with. We have something called Stevens Ministry. We even have a small group um, um, called um, Celebrate Recovery for your hurts and your habits and your hangups to help you walk through dysfunction because we don't want anyone to do it alone and thirdly we need to care for our damage because I don't care how strong you are everyone gets dinged by life no one makes it through life unscathed and the reality is, is that our kids don't only are going to have defects. Not only are our kids going to have dysfunction, but our kids are going to experience damage. And I'm wondering, have we set the example of what it looks like to actually care for damage in our life? Because here's what I discovered. We will either model that healing is a process, say amen. Healing is a process. God can do something in a moment, but usually healing is a process where you take steps. Or they will see Addictive habits where we choose to medicate our lives with entertainment and purchase or alcohol or drugs or sex. Do they see someone model how do we care for the damage? Because none of us make it through life in our marriages, in our friendships, in our finances, in our job without experiencing damage. I had the awesome experience of this week. We, we have a family friend, a young lady who just graduated from an RN programming at a pretty big uh, university here in Maryland, UMD. And my wife and I and our family, we went up to, to celebrate this, this family member, this extended family member, and just celebrate her and just cheer for her and be so excited for her. And she did the program in, in just over five years. And the reason it took her five years is she's, she's a quality student. I mean, just very, very smart. But in like her second year, her mom, <clears throat> who had been fighting leukemia, I think seven different times over 11 years, passed away. And uh, she was trying to decide, do I go back to school? And you know what? She was really wise. She realized that, you know, dealing for 11 years of having your mom have a terminal disease that she thought she'd beat multiple times and only to have it come back created stress and damage in her heart and her soul and the loss of her mom. And she, she realized that going back and pretending like that didn't happen was, was unwise. And so she said, hey, I'm not going to go back. And they allowed her to finish up the classes that she had. And, and then um, she took a semester off so that she could figure out how to navigate life in the midst of her pain. Because either we'll go through the healing process or we'll medicate the pain in an unhealthy way. And so we have to do all three of these things to model what healthy honesty looks like. We need to confess our defects, confront our dysfunction, and care for our damage. I mean, if I was going to kind of sum it up all in a simple way, I'd sum it up this way. Here's how I'd kind of sum it up. Choosing healthy, just being honest. Now, I'm not talking about unhealthy honesty, where we bring blame and shame and put things on our kids we shouldn't, but choosing healthy honesty over hiding will help our kids feel 
and because here's what I discovered about parenting. My job isn't to be perfect. My job is to be present and to point my kids to God and to prepare them for the real world. That's my simple job, not perfection. To prepare them when they face the challenges of adulthood. I was thinking about, well, how do I land the plane? How do I, how do I close this message? And I'm kind of a movie, I'm a movie buff. Got any movie buffs out there online or any movie buffs here? That's great. Two people are raising their hand. Thank you, two people out in the audience, right? Like, I love movies and stories. And did you know I was doing some research on movies and kind of stories? And you know what they said? They said the last two decades has been uniquely different in movies and TVs. It's been the golden era of the anti-hero. Do you know what an anti-hero is? The anti-hero is a someone who was severely flawed, but they end up being a hero in the moment. And there's this kind of a whole thing as they look at TV and as they look at movies, they're like, why are people so drawn to the anti-hero? Now, I'm going to name some of the anti-heroes, and this is not a recommendation. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just simply saying these are the anti-heroes of our moment. So don't say Pastor Matt said I should go watch these shows because that's not what I said. But I mean, the anti-heroes on TV are like the shows Breaking Bad. Dexter's been really popular. You know, I mean, like just anti-hero, deeply flawed people. I mean, you look at our movies. I mean, Tony Stark, Iron Man, was a selfish womanizer. You know, Doctor Strange, a self kind of narcissist, right? Deadpool, like not family friendly. Don't take your young kids to see Deadpool. Like, what is the rise of this? And as I was doing research, they kind of came up with this thing. I found an article, and I want to share it with you. And here's what they said. They said, it could be because these flawed characters offer a more, th what's the word? Truthful representation of humans. And what they're trying to say is, listen, we no longer buy the falseness that there is some perfect hero out there who will save the day. And perfect heroes make us feel less than because we can never, we can never actually get there. And what we love about the anti-hero is we see ourselves, we know we're flawed. And what we love about the flawed anti-hero is maybe there's a moment even in our flaws that we can still choose to be a hero. And it gives us something called hope. And I love that Jesus never hid the pain of his humanity or the power of divinity. So that we, when we felt overwhelmed or sad or frustrated, or we were weeping, that we could have hope. We could put our faith in the one who conquered hell and death. And what would it look like if we, as parents, instead of trying to paint this unfair picture that we're this thing that we're not, we displayed healthy honesty so that they, our kids, could give themselves grace and have faith in the parents who love them. I've been saying every week, I kind of close with a slide and I want to bring it up here and it's this, is there's no such thing as a perfect parent. If you're here and you're going, I need to be better or I mess it up, there's great news. There is no such thing as perfect parents. And the better news is, is God provides unconditional and unfailing love for us and the same God who reached us will reach our children. So I just want to close with a challenge. And you can pick one of these four challenges. Maybe as I was talking about confessing a defect, maybe there was something in the last month where you just got it dead wrong with your kids. And right now you're just going, oh, I, I need to apologize for that. Do not wait, just apologize. Maybe when I got to the dysfunction thing, you realized that this is broken pattern that's hurting you and your family. And instead of hiding it, actually getting help and confronting it would model best for you and for your family. Maybe you've experienced a tragedy, a loss, and you've been damaged. Maybe instead of medicating, you would choose to get help so that you would care for that. And if you're going, none of those actually applies to me, well, come back next Sunday as we close the series. You're not going to want to miss it. Hey, would you do me a favor? I'm going to pray. If you're online, you can pray with us. If you're in the room, would you mind standing with me as, as we pray? God, we love you. God, we thank you that Jesus modeled what we needed most. That Jesus never pretended. He never hid he wasn't unhealthy in his honesty and he never hid the reality or the pain of his humanity. 
but he displayed it in such a way that gave dignity to himself and to others. God, help us as we deal with our spouses, as we deal with our children, as we deal with each other, that we wouldn't hide and wear masks, that we'd be people who have healthy honesty so that we and our children can know it's okay to give grace but yet put our faith and our trust in the God who can do what we can. This is our hope and our prayer in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, amen.